First things first, uh, just want to make sure everybody can hear me and uh, just to say good morning. Uh, it is Friday and I can't believe it's Friday already. It feels like this week has gone by really, really, really quick. Um, so uh, what we're going to do today um, is I'm going to slow it down just a smidge for you guys. Um, one of the things that I was asked yesterday um, was to kind of slow down just a little bit for some of the newer people and to make sure that uh, no no child is left behind here. Um, so we're going to make sure that uh, everybody's got the rules, the looks. I'm going to kind of go slowly through it first. And, you know, maybe this first hour... Um, we'll end up uh, doing education and going through the setups and then uh, the last couple hours um, we'll go through and uh, watch the charts and do some trades and all that kind of good stuff. So uh, the first hour, you guys, if you're trading, you're going to be on your own. I'm going to do some education first. Uh, so the first thing that I wanted to go through, I want to go through trading plan. Um, and I, I want to skip down to the bottom of the trading plan. Um, I know it's kind of weird to skip to the bottom of the trading plan. Uh, but, you know, again, you have to start off with um, market orders, PFI. Your question is how do you take a contracts off when you're in a trade? Just change the order quantity and hit buy or sell market. That's the easy way to do it. <clears throat> um, so look, the very first thing that you guys are going to have to start off with is you're going to have to start off with some type of daily goal for yourself. And, you know, again, when you have a goal, you usually uh, are doing a good job of working towards that goal. Um, you know, yesterday we obviously reached this goal very easily. It was a very good day yesterday. Um, and... Again, $800 the contract is a lot of money, uh, especially if you're trading one, you know, two contracts, $1,600 a day uh, really does a really good job of uh, keeping everybody paid. If you have multiple accounts with Apex or some of the other funding firms, um, you know, if you make $500 to $800 a day and you multiply it times five or 10, you know, the numbers really get astronomical. Um, I was talking with somebody yesterday, and it's about the process, not the profit. And, you know, people have said this a million times. It's not new. Um, we have to focus on the correct looks and doing the correct trades at all times. And... It's the most important thing when you're a technical trader. The only thing you have is your charts and your rules. And what we're looking for is we're looking for this alignment, if you will, the agreement between our charts and the actual looks themselves. Um, so, again, I'll turn off my camera. You, don't, you guys don't have to stare at me. Um, you know, I like to have that up just, you know, I kind of got used to it in the Zoom just to say hi to everybody and, you know, let everybody uh, um, just say hey. Um, I did put a copy in the Discord just so you know. Um, I'll try to stop saying um. Uh, I've got a lot going on. I just want you to see uh, in the Discord, I put a copy of the plan. You can just download it. So you should see that up there. Um, this is going to infinity back there. Uh, once you have a copy of the plan, uh, just open it up. And what we're going to do is we're going to go through it real quick. And again, I skipped to the bottom where we have a goal. And the goal is 800 a contract. Um, most days on the NASDAQ, you don't have too much trouble making this. Uh, I'm not sure if it's a 100% realistic goal for the S&P or crude oil. Some days it is, some days it's not. Uh, $400 or $500 is probably more uh, realistic for the S&P or uh, the S uh, crude oil. 
Um, and then you have to have a set of rules that you can kind of follow and say, look, if I hit $800 per contract in profit, um, you know, again, look, when the market's giving money away, keep taking it. There's no reason not to take it. Uh, but you might you might want to set up something like this where you set up a $200 trailing stop for yourself because there's nothing worse on God's green earth than being up 800 a contract, taking a loser or two, and then continue trading until you lose all your money and then some. Um, it's a very difficult... Uh, I don't know. You guys tell me what your experience is, but I think it's a very difficult thing uh, to adhere to this rule, uh, you know, and the reason why is because we're just one trade away from getting our $200 back and it kind of sucks you into, well, if I get a perfect trade, I'll keep doing them. And, um, anyway, at some point you need to say, I, I made my money. I'm, I've done my job. I'm done for the day and I'm out of here. Um, the other thing, side of the coin if you will is if you you know if you screw the pooch and you're losing money and um, again I kind of broke this down into two uh, phases you know the first phase is if you get down four hundred dollars a contract um, you have to have this honest uh, little spell there uh, you have to have this honest assessment with yourself and you can't you can't BS yourself through this one because if you do, you know, you're not fooling anybody but yourself. Um, if you did good trades with good rules and good management and you did everything right and the market's just not behaving, which does happen, um, then, you know, you can take a break, walk around for an hour, go work out at the gym, and then come back in the afternoon and try to trade again. Um, the other, you know, the the other, you know, if you did it right, if you were rule breaking and emotionally trading and moving your stops too fast and getting out too early and doing all the wrong things, you should probably just stop for the day and take your $400 hickey and then move on to the next day so you can live another day. Um, I don't know. You guys tell me yes or no. This is a hard thing to do. Um, you know, this portion of it right here is the difference between, you know, and again, I'm guilty of this. I've blown out many, many accounts uh, over over time doing this where I just get pissed off or mad and I break these rules. And again, these rules are in place um, to protect us from us. Um, you know, there's no other reason to have rules and you're just protecting yourself from yourself. Um, so anyway, when we get into trades, you know, we have to start thinking there's a couple of, you know, I'm going backwards here. So, you know, again, look, 24, maybe 28 ticks on the NASDAQ is a maximum allowable stop. Um, if you're getting in at the right spot with the right conditions, usually six points is enough on the NASDAQ. Maybe seven uh, if you get a bad fill or something. Um, if you start risking, you know, a lot more than that, you're probably not getting really good entries. Um, we also, you know, there's a look where we trail stops and... You know, not only do we trail stops with this look, but we also can enter trades. And I made a couple of pictures because uh, there's a lot of people who have sent me a lot of pictures in the last couple of days. And uh, it's just horribly wrong um, use of trigger lines. Um, so, look, I made this picture. And... Uh, here, I'm going to give you guys a copy of this picture. So I'm going to drop it in the chat room so you guys can have a copy. Um, but there's only a couple of times where we're going to look at our range chart and we're going to use the one up, one down look. Um, and again, the, the key number one most important thing is that we've got our 8.3 and our small triggers trending together either really close to each other or not too far from each other. Um, this is the time where we're going to use the one up, one down situation. 
Um, and again, when the small triggers are above this, you know, eight threes are above the smalls, that's not the right time. Um, only when they're trending together. Um, so again, look, I made another picture or another arrow, these black arrows. And this is where most people make their mistakes with this one up, one down philosophy. Um, they're, you know, you have to have both triggers in the same direction and trending together. And when you get the small or eight three triggers below and going down, but the small triggers are still going up, that's not a use case for trying to sell one up. You're going to get run over. Um, only when they're both down do you maybe get an opportunity to sell on the way up after an up bar. Um, obviously, there's a lot of support in the way here, so it makes it very difficult. Um, so when we're doing one up, one downs, we want to do two things. Okay, Number one, we want to make sure that the two triggers are trending together. Everybody give me a yes, you understand that. And there's really only a couple spots on this chart. Um, you know, this is one spot right here where the triggers are trending together well enough that we can anticipate one down, one up, and it's going to be a good thing. Um, and, and again, hopefully you can see the spread between these triggers, and it just makes it more difficult. Um, and then ultimately, look, this is where the two are together and trending down. And then over here is another spot where they're trending together and you end up with a one down, one up, one down situation. Um, so, and then, you know, again, further along the chart, you can see we have the same thing going to the upside. They're trending together, they're both strong, and then we can anticipate that one up, one down. And I think a lot of people are getting this wrong and that's why I made this picture. Um, so again, just keep in mind that when you're thinking about either entering a trade with a one up, one down, or trailing a stop with a one up, one down, you really have to have these eight, three and small triggers trending together. That's the secret. Everybody okay with that? I just wanted to cover that initially because I know that's one of the big ones that a lot of people have really gotten stuck on. Uh, it was when to look for that one up, one down. So hopefully that's helpful. Um, second picture. Uh, you know, this is the same thing. You know, again, if you get an entry, uh, you never know what's going to happen after the fact. Uh, if you did, you'd be magical and, you know, we can anticipate what might happen going forward into the future. Uh, you know, we, we're really darn, you know, we're really good about knowing where the market's going to go. Um, that's, you know, so, uh, you know, again, when people say you can't predict the future, it's a total load of crap. Yes, you can. Um, you're not always right, but you can predict it. Um, so I had that argument with somebody the other day. Like, you can't predict the future. I'm like, yes, I can. I said, that doesn't mean I'm right all the time, but I can predict it. Um, so <laughs> anyway, semantics. Uh, so let's just assume that you bought a high volume area outside the outer bands in a strong trend. And remember what we talked about before if the market gets outside of the outer bands, that's the super duper flashing neon light for us that the market is going to be in a strong trend most of the time. And it's going to usually make it to the next fibs. Um, so we have two pieces, right? Number one, high volume area to help get in at the outer band, the upper outer band. And then as our two triggers are trending together, notice there's not a lot of room or a lot of difference or spread between these triggers. Um, this is the time where we want to be patient and we want to trail our stop. You know, again, look, you're getting in here, let's say at the high volume area first, and you'll move your stop below the low pivot. 
and then you don't move it again until technically you have a down bar and then you have an up bar and then you can move your stop and you don't really move your stop again until you have a down bar and then another up bar and then you can move your stop and you know again this process repeats itself especially in a strong you know momentum move on the nasdaq and you end up with you know 20 30 40 50 point trades so again just it's really important that these two triggers, the eight threes and the smalls, are trending together when we're thinking about one up, one downs. Uh, and I'm done with one up, one down ideas for the moment, unless somebody else has a question about that. If you do, let me know. Uh, if not, um, you know, the other... <sighs> Yeah, I mean, if it's really that strong, just leave it the hell alone and don't touch it. I mean, you can if you really want to, but if it's that strong, just leave it alone. I mean, I don't know, that's just the easy way to do it. Um, Jose, you have a question about the entry. Okay, which entry is the entry? And I'll answer your question. Uh, it depends. Um, okay, so you're talking about a one up, one down situation where you're going to use it as an entry. Jose, I just want to make sure I'm being... Uh, and then Michelle will answer your question too, at, I think, at the same time, okay? Um, when we're going to do one up one down entries the idea you know there's a old uh i have a picture for you and it's about a hundred years old and i'm going to pull it out right now and i'm going to show it to you and let's see oh my god i hope i have it shoot i don't have it uh, 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 anyway, it says buy low, sell high. I mean, that's what the picture says. Um, so anytime we're trying to get in, Jose, right, you have a choice, right? As a trader, you have a choice. You can do whatever it is that makes you the most comfortable. Okay, so first things first, we have to, you know, we have to read our charts from left to right. So from left, we're going up. In the middle chart, we're going up. And then on the chart on the right, which is our range bar chart, we're going up significantly. Everybody agree with that? So this is a situation where we have... Um, let me make a picture of my picture, if you will. Um, this is a situation where, in my opinion, and the I think the best use case for what we're doing is we're trying to buy on the way down at the area. Does this make sense, Jose? Um, and you can buy after an up bar if you really want to. Um, but ideally, you want to buy on the way down when you have support. Because what is that going to mean for you? Uh, you know, if you buy on the way down into support, let me just save this so I can blow it up a little bit. So what does it mean? Um, you know, again, just I like to think in dollars and cents. If you buy on the way down, you're going to be buying between 740 and 742. So we'll call it 741 for a round number. Fair enough? Split the difference. Um, when we look at the one to one and we have this support here, um, you know, again, that's going to act as our helper for bouncing the market back up. We almost don't need it with this look on our trigger line. So 
if you buy on the way down, let's just say you get, you know, 16741 as your entry. Once you get an up bar, your stop is going to go right below that bar. So you might have a 39 stop. So you're going to end up with two points worth of risk total to make, you know, from 41 to 53, let's just say first fib. So you're going to end up with two points risk to make 13 or 14 points. That's a seven to one risk reward ratio. Now, if you were hesitant and you said, I'm not sure, I'm feeling a little puckered, I want to wait for the up bar, then you're going to be paying, you know, the high of the bar probably plus a little bit. So you'll probably be getting in at 46. So you've essentially added $100 worth of risk and you've also removed $100 worth of profit. So now you're going to make seven to eight points in profit for, you know, having six or seven points worth of risk. So you've gone from a seven to one risk reward ratio to 1.2 to one. So you have dramatically skewed the risk reward profile on this. Um, so again, there's a monstrous benefit to buying on the way down if yeah just one down so it's one down into support and look I want to go back just for grins and giggles guys um, true, 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 true. in the year 2004 so I want you to understand when this picture is from this picture is from 2004 it's 2024 so we're 20 years later. Our trade number seven back then was a momentum continuation trade that broke a one-to-one -one and we would buy or sell a pullback to the one-to-one -one with strong small triggers. So this trade that I'm teaching you now today Buying a pullback to a one-to-one -one with strong triggers is the exact same trade we taught 20 years ago. Literally 20 years ago. So I didn't just pull this out of my ass last week and say, oh, let's come up with some kind of new something. Um, it's 20 years old. So we're actually, you know, again... I think now with our market flow and our dynamic Renko bars and the way we've got our synthetic triggers and everything that we have now, it's the same trade, but it is a hell of a lot better now than it was in 2004. Two bars down, Carl. So if you were to make a second bar down, you know, where that little box... So, you know, when we get the little box that surrounds the range bar. So if you're buying on the way down and you're, you know, you have to have one down, one up, then you put your stop down here where that box is. But the really cool thing is that once it starts going up and that box starts to shrink on your position, you can reduce, 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 reduce your risk. And then eventually it closes up and you've already got your stop one tick below. So you, <clears throat> okay, um, you're talking about this box right here, Mike. So when it's one tick away from, you know, so once the box gets, so look, it starts out as a bigger box, right? So you have the potential to go down or up. It could be 21 ticks on either side. So once you get to one tick away from a new bar, the box will turn red. And again, it might happen so fast. So like right now, let's just say hypothetically you were going to go short. And you were going to have your stop above the box. Carl, that, you see what I'm saying right here? So let's say you were going short 
And you said, if I get another bar above, then I'll be out of my position. Um, and then if it starts going down, you can start to pull that uh, stop down behind the box. Anyway, that's just just giving you, I'm not saying go short here. I'm just saying that's kind of a visual on how your stop would be placed. Uh, and then if it does go down, obviously, then you can pull it down. So is everybody okay with this one up, one down situation? Again, you know, I spent a lot of time talking about the look and the trigger lines and why it's important uh, to have the correct look and the trigger lines first. Uh, and then, you know, again, having an area to help the trade is super, super beneficial. And um, trying to see. Let me see what else we got here. That's not a real good picture. We'll just. Michelle, I was trying to find a picture where uh, things started to change a little bit on the triggers. Uh, you know, this is another example of a one up, one down situation that, again, I'm, let me blow this up so we can go really slow with it. Look, I think the one down, one ups are so freaking easy. Um, you just have to be ready for them. Um, and that's that's really the key uh, is being ready uh, and being able to say to yourself, hey, I've got momentum and I'm ready for this position. So, again, look, when you're watching your dynamic Renko bar chart, I think it's moderately easy to see that we break through a fib and we've got a lot of strength to the downside at the low. Um, this is where you have to go assess your trigger lines over here and ask yourself the question you know do we have the small triggers and the eight three triggers trending together and if the answer is yes and you've got fibonacci resistance and this is the big key over here if you don't have resistance it's really a little more difficult to do this trade not that you can't do it without resistance. It's just, you know, it's better when you have resistance helping a short position. Um, if there's no support. Well, it goes without saying, Jose, hopefully, that if you're going to take a trade, you're not doing it into a support that holds. Um, you know, this is kind of 101 stuff that we, uh, you know, that we uh, talk about every day in Mark's class and, and the basics. You know, we do not want to trade into any Fibonacci based indicator that may reverse the market because. You know, think of it as getting on the bus and you're headed to downtown, okay? So you're uptown and you're headed downtown on the bus. Well, if you get on the bus in uptown and say, take me downtown, you're going to be fine. If you're in downtown and you get on the bus and you say, take me downtown, they're going to say, you, you fool, you're already here, get your butt off the bus. Um, so again, once we reach a target area... You know, we don't, you know, again, we don't want to go short into support. That's not what we're about. Uh, we don't want to go short into support with prior divergence lows. So, again, it's really important that you guys are paying attention to the areas on your charts and make sh making sure that you're not trading into those things. Um, now, this picture also leads me to the next trade setup, which is if you have a termination condition that may very well stop the market, this is where we start looking for the white paint bar trades. Um, you know, we're trying to find one of two trades at the top or bottom and I don't know which one it's going to be it's you know 
it could either be a white paint bar trade so it depends on you know again what you know the market's going to give you one of the two usually so sometimes it's a white paint bar trade right off the top and that's totally fine um, and then sometimes the market's going to just jump a little further and you're going to end up having to do a high volume area trade where you know you don't get the top or you don't get the white bar for whatever reason and you're buying or selling pullbacks to high volume lines instead um, and again the high volume line is the high volume area of the white paint bar so again it all goes together but sometimes you don't get a fill because it jumps so quickly does that make sense sometimes it's just it's so darn fast so you're like oh man i missed it well, if you get a pullback to the high volume area, that's going to be a good opportunity for us. For example, let's just say hypothetically that, you know, you were looking for a top on this market. Maybe you were, maybe you weren't. I don't know. It doesn't matter. Um, and then you said to yourself, you know what? This white paint bar down is not quite what I'm looking for for the rules and the reason why is because the white paint bar itself happens and the 8-3 triggers are physically above the small triggers so that's not a white paint bar down that we're going to be looking to take short trades with right when we have a white paint bar down we want one like this where we have a white paint bar that has the 8-3 triggers already below the small triggers. Does that make sense? So it's a very different look. Um, again, look, this is another white paint bar that whenever you get a white paint bar from a top or bottom, just ask yourself one question. What's the comparison between my eight three triggers and my small triggers and it's going to answer you know this is a 34 range chart but same concept so again every time you get a white paint bar ask yourself this one simple question it's going to answer all the everything you ever need to know about it if a white bar down from a top happens what is the location of the 8-3 triggers versus the small triggers? If the 8-3 triggers are above, it's not a white paint bar you're going to trade. So let me add another rule for you, okay? I'll just, I'm going to write it all out for you. If the... 8-3 trigs are above the small. There will be no short trades. But you may sell the HVA line later if the triggers agree. So you don't necessarily give up on a trade, but you're not selling the white paint bar. Does that make sense? I'm going to give you guys this picture so you can save it for your own lessons. So what happens is, you know, again, look, I'm just going to scooch it forward a little bit. Eventually, the triggers get below and then you get, you know, a high volume line that you may, you know, you may decide to sell because the triggers are down. You may or may not, but anyway. And then ultimately, if you get a white paint bar down, you know, this is the more preferable white paint bar where we have the 8-3 triggers below. Um, and you can ask yourself the same question off of the low. So, and again, you have to be, you know, the, the one thing about moving your chart too far to the right is you cheat. So, look, when I move this, man, I sure wish that... Grammarly would go away. There we go. So whenever I move this to the right edge of the chart, 
and I get a white paint bar up, I ask myself the same question. Where are the 8-3 triggers in relationship to the small? Do I want to go long with that look? And the answer is unequivocally no. So notice the difference over here. Look at, I'm going to circle this white paint bar. You see the difference in this white paint bar to the left? This white paint bar is above the 8-3 triggers that are crossing up that are above the small triggers. So that's a white paint bar that if you were looking for a long, you could probably take advantage of. <clears throat> and then as we go forward, you know, again, look, just location of the white paint bar relative to the triggers. And then here we go again, you know, white paint bar down. Is this helpful going through this white paint bar monkey business? So look, at the time of the white paint bar, the eight threes are physically above the smalls. So that's not a white paint bar that you're going to sell. But don't give up on it because if the triggers roll over and you get a high volume line, you can maybe sell the high volume line. And then you end up with, you know, obviously a short that takes you down. And then you end up with another white paint bar up and you ask yourself the same question again. I mean, you don't even have to ask it. It's obvious. No, Jay, that's not correct. A white paint bar up does not mean go long. A white paint bar up with the correct trigger line look means go long. So look, back up the boat just a little bit and let's read the rules together. Are you ready? So look, this is where people fail. They start thinking about staring at their market flow chart and they forget about the rules. So let's just back the train up and let me do something. Uh, I know this is crazy talk, but let's do it anyway. heck did I put okay you guys ready I'm gonna give you a copy of this picture I know everybody with a penis hates this they're called directions half of you without a penis hate this you know mo half of women day traders don't like to read directions too so I'm not excluding all the women out there, but uh, most men don't like to read directions. They just say, fuck it. I see a white paint bar. Let me just trade the shit out of it and see what happens. I'll figure it out later. Oh. Um, tell me if I'm wrong, but <laughs> I've done this for too long. All right, here we go. Back on track. Rules, rules, rules. So let's read the rules together. Let's make sure we understand them. If you're going to do a white paint bar trade, the charts that you're looking at, meaning large dynamic Renko bar chart, medium dynamic Renko bar chart, range bar chart, all of your charts must have a good top or good bottom. So the number one rule is you must have a termination condition that you would bet a small body part on. And you'd say, you know what, you can take the end of my pinky off if that doesn't hold because I'm pretty sure it's going to hold. So start with the ultimate look for it should hold and I'd bet on it. Then you have to make sure that your trigger lines are not strong against you. Does everybody know what strong trigger lines look like? Let's not guess. Let's just look at the trading plan. Um, for example, I'll open up this picture. This is where you have some type of divergences and terminations on a small chart. And if you go short, 
you're doing it against strong trigger lines up on the big chart and you're going to end up losing your position. So it's imperative that you're not just staring at a range bar chart and a small chart you must have all three charts at a key area that you have a very good possibility of holding. Everybody give me a yes, you understand that. One chart's not enough, two charts is better, all three charts at a good top or bottom is the best. And if you go short or you go long, I have a picture uh, that I've used for many, many, many years. Um, I'm going to break it out on you right now. If you go short against strong triggers, that's what we call how to commit financial suicide in one easy step. I wrote a book. The number one way to commit financial suicide, day trading the market, is going short against strong triggers or long against strong triggers. Or the second way to commit financial suicide faster than you can shake a stick at is trading into termination conditions. So these are two things that you should not be doing. Number one, don't trade against strong triggers. And number two, don't trade into termination conditions. Um, we say it all the time, but it's amazing how many people actually still do it. Um, so white paint bar trade, good top, good bottom. Make sure the trigger lines are not past the area that we're trying to trade. And then when the market flow generates a white paint bar, this is when we're going to buy or sell the market, assuming that our trigger lines are on the correct side. So, you know, again, with, there's three components to... Uh, the puzzle. Number one, we have to have a good top or a good bottom. Number two, we want to make sure that our range chart triggers are correct. And then number three, um, you know, again, oops, bear with me, I clicked the wrong button. Um, and then number three, you know, again, look, the other thing that we talked about and you know, again, I've got an illustration of it. I've got a couple illustrations of it. Um, here's one, right? We've already talked about this and it's in the plan and hopefully this makes a lot of sense to you guys now. When you're at that bottom and you want to go along with a white paint bar, you're going to assess where your 8-3 triggers are in relationship to the small triggers. Right? You guys are never going to mess this up again, are you? So, <clears throat> hang on a second. Bear with me, guys. Two seconds. Um, mm -mm, sorry, somebody messaged me. Um, so anyway, hopefully the difference between these two things uh, is very, very clear. Bear with me here. Two seconds. I just got to send a message here. Everybody okay with this? I'll just, you know, again, sorry, I got a little distracted here. I've got four people freaking messaging me. I just, I needed to catch up on a couple of those messages real quick. 
Um, and again, you're going to see it, uh, you know, in the plan, I've got a couple different pictures. Um, this is another picture of the exact same thing at the top. It's really, really, really tempting. You're going to find yourself being tempted unmercifully by these white paint bars. And you're going to be like, oh, man, because... Sometimes they're on the wrong side and they just go anyway. And they just, they do it to train you to do the wrong thing. Um, when it's right and when the triggers are on the correct side, you usually end up with a really, really, really nice winner. All right, so back on track here. Uh, uh, uh. I just want to see what this picture is. Again. There are certain looks that we have on our larger charts that are going to be more beneficial than others. Um, there's a couple of checks that you can um, yeah um, that's exactly right. Learn hand. We we don't even really worry necessarily about the range charts until we're in a position on the other charts to even think about them. Um, so that's why I put my charts to be like this. You know, look, I've got these two charts up and running, and um, just to kind of give you a uh, obviously the market's going crazy here, and we'll get back to it here in a minute, but. Um, I just wanted to show you just kind of a picture of what I've got for my charts. And, you know, I think it's really important that, you know, look, these are the two main charts in my main straightaway, straightaway, can I say that, vision. Because these are the two, you know, base charts that we've always used. And these are the two that are right in my vision. And believe it or not, I made another picture of this yesterday. I know uh, you guys think I'm a little bit crazy making so many pictures. But uh, I made the, a different picture. <sighs> Let me find it for you. I'm going to drop it in on you. This is a crude oil slash S&P picture, but it's the, it's a picture of the same thing I'm going to show you now. Um, you know, again, look, the two main charts that are in my vision are the dynamic Renko bar 13.2 or 5.1 if it's crude oil. Um, and then on a monitor to the left, I have my larger range chart. And then on a monitor to the right, I've got my smaller range chart. And essentially, we're looking at the 13.2 and 13 range for tops or bottoms. Right? They kind of confirm at the same time tops or bottoms. Um, they also, the 13.2 and the 13 range are good for trend trades if... You know, we make a good top and we start really trending down, then we're going to look for trend trades, and that's where we can kind of peek over at our range bar chart and see if the larger range chart helps our trend trades. Um, if we get a good top and then we start getting divergences on our smaller chart, this is where we can go to our eight range market flow chart and say, okay. Am I getting a white paint bar with the correct trigger line configuration so I can get in a little bit earlier? And it doesn't take away from doing trend trades later. It's just the, you know, it's right at the tippity top edge is where we're looking at that smaller market flow chart. And it's the same thing when I look at the NASDAQ. I'm looking at, you know, again, we hit big fibs up here, so... You know, once we hit big fibs, I would start looking at all my charts and saying, hey, at what point, you know, does the 21 range chart help? So, you know, if these two charts don't get to the right spot, then I don't need to look at this chart or this chart. Does that make sense? 
hopefully. So again, look, a good example of having the two charts get to a really good spot. So now that I'm at a really good spot and I've got you know fibs and I've got divergence and I've got lower divergence over here on this chart this is the time where I have to go look at my range chart and say hey what happened right so again I have it on my other screen but I'm pulling it over here so look at what point did I have the white paint bar that fit the rules 10 Jose is the answer to your question. 10 days back on all my charts. So look, we had the area. And remember the little lesson that we just did on the white paint bars? So first white paint bar down. Give me an assessment of the 8-3 triggers versus the smalls. Eh, that's not the look we're looking for to go short, is it? Not at all. So the market messes around and then we ask ourselves the same question later. The next white paint bar down, do we have the right trigger line configuration to go short? Hell yeah, we do. So, you know, again, what was that worth? I don't know. 15, 13, down to, you know, before it even blinked, it was only worth 40 NASDAQ points. So that's a really good example of a white paint bar short from Fibonacci resistance with everything on the correct side. Now, we didn't take it because I'm going slow as Christmas teaching it to you. Um, but now that you know it, well, but here's the other thing. Are you ready for this? We've accounted for this. So look at the plan. When there's multiple divergences on white paint bar trades, go fast, which means you're not getting a pullback. So here's the picture from the plan. It says, and I quote, if there's multiple divergences, white bar go fast go now there's usually not a pullback damn near like i was about to read your mind so when you look at your real world and you say to yourself was there multiple divergences before that white paint bar and I think we can reasonably say yes, there was a divergence and a lower divergence. <laughs> well, look, this is not something that's going to be naturally intuitive to you immediately. Every single person who's gone through my lessons and learned this methodology, it takes weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks of work and you still are going to miss a lot of trades just because you're going to go uh is that my and then you're going to be like mother scratcher that was and it's too late <laughs> yeah there's not you have to have your plan bulletproof and ready to rock and roll or else you're going to end up missing a lot of trades and it's okay the nasdaq look the NASDAQ creates 40 trades a day, most days. 40. And I'm not BSing you or blowing smoke up your butt. I'm talking 40 freaking trades that you can take. So, again, when you go back to your goals and objectives, look, you're only trying to make 800 bucks a contract. You don't have to catch them all. You only need two or three good trades and you'll get... 800 bucks a contract so you don't have to sit there and spend 12 hours trading you know traditionally from 10 to 12 you can make that or you know it's one hour one hour of trading on the nasdaq when it's moving and you make your 800 bucks a contract so you're gonna miss more trades than you're gonna catch you have to you know look here's the really uh if you trade the S&P and you miss a trade, 
you are 100% screwed because you now have three hours until you're going to get another one, right? I mean, God forbid you miss it and don't get paid, or worse yet, God forbid you take it and screw it up and lose when you should have won. Now you got to wait hours to redeem yourself, whereas on the NASDAQ, it takes about three minutes for you to reset, start going the other way, and start doing trend trade longs all of a sudden uh, after the bottom gets put in. I mean, it's literally, it's that fast. So, you know, again, the market's very quick right now, but quick is fine as long as you've got your plan right. You know, this is a good example of, you know, the way I would use a a uh, 34 range market flow chart to help with a trend trade long you know so one of the things that I really dig and you guys will too remember we talked about let's tie it all together now remember the trigger line configuration that we like to see for one up one downs right we want to see these things trending together strong etc etc Right, so again, you know, we got a really good look trending together strong. When we get a pullback, a one down, right, we're asking ourselves, do we have an area where that trade happens from? And again, mid, for us, mid band and large triggers is a trend trade spot. So, yes, do we have a spot that we could buy with this much momentum on our big chart? hopingly propelling us to the upside. So let's see what Jeremy did. All right. So Jeremy, you bought the bottom with an HVA trade. And you were very happy. You made a bunch of money, which is fantastic. And then you skipped the trend trade. <laughs> and again, it's not about what you what you miss, it's about what you get. You know, just because he missed this trend trade, it doesn't matter. There's going to be another one that, you know, there's going to be more trades that are coming in the next 10 minutes, I promise. There always is. So, again, look, just to recap the educational portion of what we're doing today. Uh, very simply. Right, so trend trades are still trend trades. Nothing has changed on that. The only difference when we're looking for a trend trade is we're going to try to buy at the exact spot if we have a very strong 34 range, one up, one down look. And again, we spent a lot of time uh, on these triggers making sure that you guys are competent in your reading of the two triggers when you're going to do a one up one down look so hopefully everybody's okay with this right so again strong triggers one up one down we'll do trend trades everybody's okay with that hopefully the second one is 34 five you know or whatever your big medium and small charts all put in a termination condition and then the most important thing that we talked about was making sure that the white paint bar is on the correct side of your 83 triggers and your 83 triggers are on the correct side of your small triggers Hopefully a very valuable lesson for you guys. It's going to keep you from doing the wrong trades too early, getting stopped out, only to be puckered up, and then watch the real trade go without you. There are times where you can cheat this a little bit, but I'm not going to teach you guys how to cheat. You can figure that out on your own. Um, the other one is high volume area trades. Again, I think these are really easy. The you know the most important thing with a high volume area trade is make sure that your triggers are on the correct side of each other. Michelle, finally, I found the damn picture I was looking for. Um, I want you to see what I've got here. Do you see how the 
eight three triggers and I was very very quick uh, you know I was horsing around on this take profit trader here but I was very very quick to manage my risk because the eight three triggers were physically below and it's a very weak look and you know again it's not that you can't take a trade it's just you have to really see the continuation right away because if the eight three triggers get on the wrong side that's not the most favorable look for what we want so again that that would be a, a situation where you would manage your position much tighter you know, look, you wouldn't want to give it this much room. You'd want to give it this much room. I'm glad I finally got to that picture. Um, and then ultimately, look, HVA breakouts. I love these things in the right situation. Right when we get the market put in a bottom and we're trending up a little bit, and you know, there's a high volume line we're not going to go short with because the triggers are wrong. However, if we break above it, it usually becomes support and we're going to use it as support to propel us to the upside or downside. So a high volume area is not only a good spot to trade, but it's also a good spot to watch for breakouts. So and then ultimately, remember, we've got one up, one down trade setups and, you know, for the last 24 years, nothing, 20 years plus, nothing has changed. If you're going to buy a one down, make sure you're doing it into some semblance of support, fibs, mid bands, one to ones, something to help you define that area a little bit. And yes, it's going to be fast. So. You know, if you are really slow on the draw, you may not be a NASDAQ trader. Um, trading the NASDAQ takes months and months and months of practice. Once you actually get good at the NASDAQ, I don't know if you can ever go back. Um, I would literally have to train myself probably for a month to slow down and learn how to be extra patient the nice thing about the nasdaq is when you lose you lose in about three seconds and when you win it only takes about two or three minutes to win um, it's really 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 quick instantaneous feedback on uh, what we're looking for Whew. okay so I recorded that session just so that way you guys can have go back and play that back. Uh, I'm going to stop it there and then we'll record again. But I wanted to get the lesson part of it recorded.